Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Live Yes RA goal setting event. My name is Christina Schaefer. Um, I am a rheumatoid arthritis patient who has been living with rheumatoid arthritis for almost 18 years. Um, when I was first diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, like many of you probably do now, I had a lot of questions. How would this new diagnosis impact my life? Would I still be able to do the things I love? What does this disease mean for my health in the long term? While I know firsthand how overwhelming and confusing an RA diagnosis can be, I'm here to tell you, you have more power than you think. There are many things you can do to take control of your arthritis so that you can live a fulfilling, productive life. Empowering myself uh, by learning about my disease and working with my healthcare provider to set realistic goals helped me get where I am today. And it's exactly what the next hour and a half will help you do. Our expert guest this evening, rheumatologist, Dr. Christopher Collins, will guide you through how to manage various aspects of rheumatoid arthritis from uh, disease basics to treatments and medications, as well as offer tips to set impactful goals to help you thrive. Events like this are informed and driven by patients like you. With your input, the Arthritis Foundation can create more educational tools, resources, and programs that will speak to what's really important to you and to help you live your best life. Uh, with that, I'd like to share a short video with you um, to tell you about our insights program so that you can make your voice heard and help us create more programs like this one. We'll go ahead and run that video for you. By taking part in the Live Yes Insights Assessment, you help change lives today, including your own. And you help change the future of arthritis. It takes just 10 minutes or less to share your experience and make a difference. Answer simple questions, like how often you felt arthritis pain in the last week, Ongoing insights data from people like you will lead to new resources that ease daily life. Your insights show what kind of support you need in your community. You improve the healthcare system. You focus researchers and others on top priorities. You'll make more research funding possible, leading to new groundbreaking treatments. The power is in your hands to change things now and for the future. This is your opportunity to change the future of arthritis. So we would encourage you all, <laughs> that's how you know it's a live event. Uh, we would encourage you all to take that um, insights assessment today. Again, it's arthritis.org slash insights. And um, I will also just mention that you can take the insights more than once. Uh, I've taken it a few times and actually got an email reminder the other day, letting me know it was time to take it again and update my assessments because we as arthritis patients know that you might feel a certain level of pain today, but maybe two or three months from now, you're going to feel a different level of pain and maybe there are different issues that are concerning you. So we do encourage patients to take that more than once. Just a few housekeeping items before we get to our subject matter expert. We have muted all attendees for this event. You can direct any questions you may have throughout the presentation in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be broken down into two main parts. The first part will help you better understand rheumatoid arthritis. The second part is designed to help you better manage your disease and improve your healthcare experience through a series of many lessons. These lessons will teach you how to track your symptoms so that you, to help you learn how RA affects you, how to come up with actionable goals to help you better manage your disease, and then also how to work with your healthcare provider to come up with an individualized treatment plan. We'll also brainstorm goals together so you can walk away from this session with realistic, applicable ways to help you manage your disease effectively. After tonight's session, you'll receive an email about your experience these surveys help us track the success of these sessions and better plan for future events. 
Before we begin, we'd like to take a minute to just learn a little bit more about who we have here in the audience today. So we are going to um, run a few polls and we can start the first one. There we go. Um, and they're all on here. So the first one is how long have you had RA? And you can select the applicable bubble there. Hopefully you should see a second window that popped up with your poll. How long have you had RA? How are you feeling today on a scale of one to five? One being not great, five being great. Uh, what is your number one reason for attending these sessions? Or this session, excuse me, specifically this session. So go ahead and answer those. And while you do, we will go ahead and finish up that poll. And then we are going to get started by introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Christopher Collins. Dr. Collins is an adult rheumatologist who most recently was the fellowship program director for the Division of Rheumatology, MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and an associate professor of medicine at Georgetown University Medical Center. All uh, excuse me, while in academic medicine, he ran one of the largest lupus clinics in the DC metropolitan region, as well as several inflammatory arthritis clinics. Prior to joining the hospital center, Dr. Collins was a senior research fellow at the National Institute for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases at, at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Collins, welcome and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> um, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, uh, wherever you are. It's a real pleasure to, to be back speaking for the Arthritis Foundation. Um, so we're going to spend, oh, maybe we can uh, start off actually looking at the results of the poll. And so I think these are great interactive features that we can do. I'm going to ask that we get off the picture of my face, that we can start the next slide. And then we'll come back and we'll go over the poll results. All right. So uh, majority of the audience has had, uh, this disease for more than two years. And so everyone here probably understands really what's going on, uh, many of you more than me, I'm sure. Um, but there are a sizable percent of people whom also have a different type of arthritis or have a loved one with arthritis. So I think we're in a good place to start with this. Um, and the most of you are feeling okay. I'm, I'm sorry for the 20% that are poor, very poor. Hopefully so, these kinds of talks will be uplifting and by the end of this, you'll be feeling better. And for those people feeling great, good for you. So why are you here to learn more about the disease? That's perfect. Goal setting communications, it's pretty balanced ways to look at uh, this program and what it can have to offer you. So I think we'll hopefully be able to hit on all of these. And um, I don't know what the last question was, so we're gonna ignore that. <laughs> Um, all right, so for those of you who don't know, rheumatoid arthritis is the kind of stereotypical autoimmune disease, which the primary targets are the small joints in your body. That tends to focus mostly around the joints in the wrists and the ankles, but can also affect other joints like elbows and knees, uh, the neck, and certainly your fingers and things like that. And it's hallmarked by swelling and inflammation. So the most common type of arthritis out there, osteoarthritis, what we call more of a mechanical arthritis, that tends to be either injury related or older age related when we just kind of get mechanical things. It doesn't really have a high degree of inflammation. You don't really get the degree of swelling that you do from an autoimmune type of arthritis like rheumatoid. And so those are the hallmark features. It's really hot and swollen when it's active. It tends to feel a lot worse in the mornings, especially with, with stiffness and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and it is one of the more painful things that anyone will ever have to go through. So next slide. But what you may not know is that rheumatoid arthritis actually does more than just affect your joints. It actually has a whole host of things that can be involved with the inflammation. And so when we talk about the inflammation you see in the joints, sometimes you get little collections of immunoglobulins and whatnot called rheumatoid nodules. Those can exist in the skin, especially around the elbows. Sometimes they actually can form inside the lungs. Lungs themselves can get scar tissue, and this is from small vessel inflammation inside the lungs. The heart can also get inflammation, but 
just having rheumatoid arthritis carries forth a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, which is the causes of heart attacks, as well as stroke. Uh, additionally, it can also cause a lot of inflammation in other organs that are fed by different blood vessels. And finally, in the eyes, most of you probably have had this, a bit of a dry eye is from uh, the inflammation that rheumatoid arthritis causes, as well as an increased risk for glaucoma and cataracts. And so uh, you can see that all of these things are very important to control, not just the joint pain, because it really is a systemic disease. Next slide. So we've been treating rheumatoid arthritis for obviously a long time, but it wasn't really until about 20 some odd years ago that we really kind of changed our direction and started using much more aggressive therapies and really has defined kind of a renaissance period for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. But still at its cornerstone, we still use a lot of the conventional drugs that we always have. Uh, these include non steroidal anti-inflammatories, occasionally maybe a short burst of prednisone, hopefully not too much. Um, most people are going to either have been exposed to or heard of methotrexate. It still is the power workhouse for patients with rheumatoid arthritis and generally very effective. But for those patients on whom it's not or who can't tolerate it, we do have newer drugs that have been now around for a couple of decades, and these are the biologics. And there are on lattice count, six or seven different types, some within multiple agents within each type. And so there's lots of options when it talks about how to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And these are very targeted uh, medications which work specific areas of the immune system to control that inflammation. And then the most recent are the oral pills called the JAK inhibitors, which are also very specific and are intended to work sometimes by themselves or in combination with methotrexate. Next slide. <clears throat> so what can we do to, to help, what can you do to help yourself, right? And so obviously as your physician, my goal for you is to come to your clinics and take your medications as directed. But when you're at home, you want to do more for yourself. Uh, and so the Arthritis Foundation has put together a really nice talk here that is really intended to help you empower yourself and how to take control of your healthcare, uh, take control of your system as much as possible. Uh, and really improve your, your life. And so one of the things that we kind of make sure everyone understands is that physical activity is critical. Um, what you should know is that, it, you know, you do what feels good and works well for you. Um, low impact aerobics are generally more preferable than say, taking up jogging. If you've never jogged before and you don't have the right gait, you're gonna have some impact on those ankles. So maybe more low impact aerobics, like an elliptical machine or something like that, but also focus on strengthening and flexibility to make sure that your joints stay as limber and strong as possible. If you can get a therapist, uh, ask your rheumatoid or your RA specialist, your uh, either nurse practitioner or clinician uh, to get you some physical therapy at least a few times a year. It always is good to check in um, and think of it as a free personal training. <clears throat> Diet, everyone's always very interested in what they can do to eat well and to make sure that, uh, you know, is there something I can do to make my rheumatoid arthritis better or go away? And the bottom line is that while you can read a lot of different things out there that say, ah, oh, this is a good diet for rheumatoid arthritis or avoid these other kinds of foods, it's very, very individual. I've never had one universally effective kind of thing. Um, the guiding principles are Avoid highly processed foods and avoid foods that have a, a lot of, of names. If you read the label, you can't pronounce half of them. It probably wasn't really intended to eat. Um, and then make sure you go for healthy foods, right? Go for the, those foods rich in nutrients. And I, I know Cheetos look like carrots, but they're not carrots. You just got to eat the carrot. Um, as far as other things to use, like hot and cold therapies, I, I think they're great. I think in general, uh, for achy and sore backs and stuff, heating works really well. I think that for acutely inflamed joints, like a big, hot, swollen knee, a cold pack actually is very beneficial for that as well. Make sure you're not doing it for more than 20 minutes on or 20 minutes and then followed by 20 minutes off. Um, and you can alternate that, but don't like, you know, put a burning hot pack on there for two hours. You could actually burn yourself, so be careful with that. Uh, but the general rule is 20 minutes on, then at least followed by 20 minutes off. Um, try to balance your schedule. I mean, I, I hate to say that stress, um, it, it, you know, stress is just part of life these days, especially in the 
in a pandemic. Um, but I can't tell you how much stress impacts health. And so uh, keeping that in mind, try not to, to overschedule yourself and take those breaks that you need to, to make sure you're feeling rested and, and, and de-stressed a little bit over time. Prioritize good sleep habits. Find ways to ease that anxiety and, and develop a good support, support network. And whether or not that's friends or family or whomever, um, make sure that you have a, a group of people that are there to listen to you and help you find your way when you're getting down. Next slide. So um, before we move into a little bit of Q&A, there's always interest around supplements. Um, and so the first is, is around anti-inflammatory compounds, namely fish oil and turmeric. Um, and so there, there have been some good studies out there that have suggested some potential benefits for these uh, omega-3 fatty acids and the turmeric compounds in reducing some pain and tenderness and swelling, uh, as well as the need for a lot of uh, non steroidal use. So I'm a big advocate. Uh, if you find a compound that uh, doesn't have a big fishy oil aftertaste, or you really like Indian food, you're gonna you're gonna go well with this one. Um, but you know, beware that these aren't FDA um, monitored compounds, and so there's a lot of variability and over the counter. Uh, supplements that you buy at, say, a, a GNC or something else that there's no kind of solid recommendation of what's the right milligram to take as not, and, and in some cases, not a lot of quality control in the production of these supplements. And so just buyer beware, make sure you try to find uh, something from a reputable uh, producer and, um, and then talk to your clinician about maybe what's the right dose for you because it can be individual. Um, for CBD, and this is also medical marijuana, uh, these are very limited studies. Um, be aware that there's obviously a lot of uh, a concern around them and the differences in quality and quantity that occur with it. Um, and so I, I think it's a very personal choice, but know that there's not a lot of good sound scientific data for disease modifier, but I do understand that those some patients could help with pain control. So next slide, and I think this is our first question slide, and then I'll turn to our chat thing and see what yes. kind of questions are coming in? Yes, thank you so much. Let's pause for a few questions. Um, I see a few have already come in, but if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. And Dr. Collins, I might need you to repeat that and let me record it. Carrots and Cheetos are not the same thing. I'll have to <laughs> tell... I need to get my five-year-old to understand that. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we do have a couple questions already. Um, how long after starting medications is it likely that I'll achieve remission? So it's uh, a great question. I think on average, um, the say you were an ideal responder to the best medicines that are out there. Uh, most medicine, you achieve what we call a maximal gain by around six months of therapy. And after that, you tend to really plateau and you're not going to get a lot more out of that particular medicine or combination. So when I generally was prescribing these drugs, I would have two inflection points uh, generally at three, month three. Uh, I generally by three months wanted to definitely see you improving. Uh, and then by month six, we would kind of get an idea of where you are as far as response to therapy and understand, mm -hmm. were you in remission or do we need to add on or change up therapy? So what is remission? So remission is effectively the absence of active disease, both clinically and in blood tests, looking at inflammation. And so you should really have no swollen or tender joints. And again, you have to differentiate what is a, a rheumatoid arthritis kind of pain versus mm -hmm. uh, an osteoarthritis ache and pain or something like that. But a true rheumatoid arthritis kind of inflammatory pain, plus no inflammation in your bloodstream. And no, it doesn't mean you're cured. It just means mm -hmm. that you're well controlled and in remission. And I've had patients stay that way for decades and sometimes even coming off of medications. The rheumatoid arthritis, unfortunately, is not a disease at this time that we can cure. Maybe one day we can um, but where science hasn't gotten to that point, it is one that we can treat very effectively, mm -hmm. but we cannot at this time cure it. Okay. 
Um, so this kind of ties into that a little bit. Um, you mentioned the benchmarks at three months and six months and what you kind of expect to see there. Mm-hmm. How long should you be on a treatment before you switch to a new one? So I think there's kind of two parts to this, the yeah. how long before you try something new and how long before, yeah. you know, does it, do you need to, how does that work? Yeah. So obviously it, it's, it's a, a very nuanced kind of uh, response. Fortunately, I think that everyone's an individual. And so to say somebody who is their first time on a new drug, um, the question really then is, well, how happy are you with your response? Are you back to where you want to be? Or do you and your clinician together feel you can do better? Mm -hmm. And that timing is generally maybe even three to six months. Exactly. On the other hand, you could be somebody who has tried 12 different drugs and you're about as good as you've been and it's two years into it you're like you know i I, there's a new one that just came on the market i want to try it and so Mm -hmm. that's the kind of decision making that goes into that time frame but like i said i think generally most patients by six months are going to know is this the is this what it's going to be for me or not and then you Mm -hmm. work with your doctor to find the right path forward Absolutely. Really important questions for your doctor. Um, so another question, if I haven't responded well to a standard DMAR, then when will a biologic be introduced? So it, this is a, an evolving kind of understanding over the years as well. It used to be that, um, you know, we would only take the worst of the worst and put them on a biologic. I think these days, um, most insurance plans require you only to have been on three months of methotrexate before being considered eligible uh, for a biologic. And I think a lot of mm-hmm. clinicians are inclined to try to get people on biologics earlier in the disease course. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the earliest I would say would be three months into an oral DMAR therapy before your biologic would be introduced, but it could stretch a longer depending on, you know, the degree of response that you had. And maybe you want to see a little bit longer if methotrexate is going to get you there, because that also takes about six months in total to really kind of feel out where you're going to be. Okay. Are there patients that sometimes need to go straight into the biologic because it's so severe? There's a few, but, and still, I think that, um, unfortunately living in a country with, with, um, managed healthcare system, driving a lot of decision-making, unfortunately, they make you still go through some hoops Mm -hmm. and it's not without reason. I still think that, um, there is enough patients that do well on methotrexate alone that that is a worthy attempt to see. Um, Mm -hmm. But I I would say that this day and age, no, something like 75% of RA patients uh, either are or have been on biologic before. Okay. A few more questions here. Um, How often should you have your blood work done? Are lower inflammatory markers a sign of remission? So uh, unfortunately, inflammatory markers are... um, affected by a lot of different things, including rheumatoid arthritis. So they, in of them themselves, aren't terribly helpful, but you have to put them in a larger clinical context. Mm-hmm. And so you could have very, very, you know, non-active arthritis, but have an, an elevated inflammatory marker because maybe you have a viral infection or something like that. So you, you have to put the two together. How often should you get them measured really depends on the status of your arthritis and if you're actively managing and doing different things and you're seeing your doctor more often, or you are well-established and long-standing and you're not on anything that affects the liver or anything else like that. And you can, I had patients, I would just check blood once a year. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> it really depends. So you mentioned earlier the resources um, on the Arthritis Foundation website about CBD. Can you take CBD and any of these drugs at the same time? This specific one says methotrexate, but what if they're also taking biologics? Yeah, I don't know if anyone studied that explicitly, but so far there haven't been any safety signals about CBD and concomitant other medications. So I don't see how necessarily that would be a problem. But again, that's, you know, not something that's been studied exhaustively. So, Okay. Um, my RA has been controlled for over seven years on Placanol Presco, excuse me, if I pr- mispronounce that brand, they don't make it anymore. Dr. Reddy's lab and North star do not work for me. Is it so common for generics to be so different? Uh, they technically shouldn't be right. So the FDA puts a tight regulatory, um, uh, requirement that generics be proven to have the same broad effects and work 
uh, the same as the brand name that they are ascribed to. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do have, and everyone can attest to having had a, a poor response to a generic than they did mm -hmm. uh, a brand name. So I understand and maybe you just, you have to try a different generic or alter the dose a little bit, um, but it does happen. But I've, I mean, as for throughout my career, I think I've had pretty good luck with generics, but mm -hmm. um, I understand every, everything's individualized and, and I'm not discounting that you're not having that, but mm -hmm. it's not common, but it certainly does happen. I think it's important that they're noticing the difference um, and yeah. hopefully talking with their doctor about it. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, just a couple more things here. I think one more question, then we can get back to the rest of um, the session. I had a left ACA stroke 105 days ago. My, uh, I think right side had paralysis. Uh, RA has been well controlled on Humira. Rheumatologist was utterly unconcerned. It remains cryptogenic. Um, I'm terrified. Any feedback? Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I'm sorry that you had a stroke and mm -hmm. I've been sided with some paralysis. That's very mm -hmm. unfortunate, of course. Um, it's possible that having had a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis contributed to that. And mm -hmm. we certainly know that RA is a contributing risk factor for stroke and heart disease. I do. I'm glad to hear that your RA is well controlled on one of the biologics, Humira, in this case. Um, and so I, I, I'm not to, to say your, your rheumatoid arthritis should be alarmed. Your, your rheumatologist should be alarmed. Um, but I think that when you talk with them, that they make sure that they also to understand the importance of having well controlled RA to, to diminish con additional contributing risk factors for additional strokes or heart disease. So make sure that they understand that there is, you know, a connection between the two and that it's of mm -hmm. utmost importance that you keep your RA under tight control. Yeah. I um, actually took a picture when you had the slide up that said how RA may affect your health, because again, even just as patients, we forget how, how much it truly affects our entire body. That's and right. it might be your hands and, and wrists one year and the next year it's your lungs and eyes. You never know. So um, thank you again for sharing that because it's an important reminder. So we're going to end the Q&A portion now, um, but if you will have time to ask more questions of Dr. Collins a little bit later in the session. So feel free to type those in and we can get to those. And Dr. Collins, I'll let you take it back over. Great. So uh, the next session we're going to be moving into is, is tracking your health. And <clears throat> I think uh, this is kind of really something a lot of, lot of people think about, but I think is an incredibly important aspect of health management in general. Um, tracking your own health is the ability to not only help you be more self-aware, but also then to help provide that information to your clinician to make it a more fruitful visit when you see them. So if we go to the first slide. So what we're gonna cover in subsequent slides are the kind of things that you can monitor um, and what the Live Yes RA program can offer to help you uh, do that. Uh, also I explain a little bit why to do it, but we'll cover that in more detail next time. So what are the things that can be tracked? Um, well, you can track your pain level, first of all, and this is pretty easy. Most uh, everybody has been familiar now with the 10 point, we call it a Likert scale of uh, pain. And you can rate that severity from zero and no pain or 10 pain that is genuinely, you know, affecting your life. Um, I used to be a, a little, uh, wary of, of people who said my, my pain's a 10 because I was like, yeah, but come on, if I sawed your leg off with no anesthesia, what would your pain level be then? But then I really started thinking about it. This was long ago, but I, a pain, pain level of 10 is okay. What it really is just saying is that today I'm having so much pain that it is, it is dramatically affecting me. Yes, of course I can have more pain, but it is what I can't tolerate. That is a 10 for me. And then you can kind of go where everything else in between. You don't have to say like, yeah, I know I can imagine the pain could be worse and then downgrade your pain. If it really is bothersome, be honest about what that pain level is. You can track your sleep patterns, right? A lot of smartwatches do that for these days. Certainly, you know, keep tax of track of when you go to bed, when you wake up, are you having problems, uh, restful sleep, you know, are you getting 
woke it up a lot because of something. Keep track of those things. And when you look at them, you can see patterns and perhaps ways to intervene to improve upon them. You can keep track of your mood, smiley face, frowny face, neutral face. These are apps that do all sorts of fun stuff like that. Water intake. Can't stress enough how important uh, adequate water intake is, at least two liters a day. Um, and you really need to, to focus on that. I think in general, I probably don't drink enough water. Um, but keep tabs on it. <clears throat> if you're not drinking enough, make sure you drink a little bit more. Food choices. And again, we talked about the difference between a Cheeto and a carrot, but moves beyond that. You want to keep track. Uh, you don't have to get down to the specifics of it, but in general, keep an idea of the kinds of foods that you're eating. Obviously, symptoms, <clears throat> these go beyond just pain, whether or not you're having stiffness, whether or not you're having you know, cough or fever or anything else like that that needs to be discussed with your doctor. With some activities, a lot of uh, step counters are out there that you can measure how far you're walking in the activity. Uh, you can actually sometimes just even having a phone in your purse or pocket will be able to help you monitor how much activity you're getting. Uh, and finally, there are some standardized um, questionnaires that assess something called activities of daily living or ADLs. And these have been shown to correlate very well overall with rheumatoid arthritis control. And so there's a number of different ways that you can do this and capture the ones that can get translated into what we call either a rapid three score or one of the other metrics that the doctor can speak to and know more about. Next slide. So what are some of the ways that we can help you track some of these, these things? So there's something called a Better Living Toolkit. And so this is available through the Arthritis Foundation. Um, you can go to the arthritis.org slash better living toolkit and download a number of these things that are in paper and you can print them, uh, as well as track your disease through the website itself. And you can set goals and we'll do some goal setting exercises here in a little bit. Uh, tips about communication with your doctor. Uh, as well as learn more about your disease. And then of course, those health trackers that I was talking about. So next slide. So um, I think we're gonna do a survey now. Is this what this says? Yes, we do have another poll. Perfect. There you go. So I'll, I can go ahead and read it for you, Dr. Collins. It's just, um, this is for a health tracking poll. So what areas do you currently track? Um, pain levels, steps, calories, hours of sleep, amount of physical activity or exercise, water intake, or I haven't started tracking anything yet. So go ahead and take that poll. And then Dr. Collins will review it with you once we're done. Bonus points if you're already tracking more than one, I guess, right? <laughs> All right, there we go, Dr. Collins. Hope All right, perfect. That. So um, the screenshot that's currently up is, is just from the Better Living Toolkit. And so after you finish, for example, the one of the health tracking ones, it'll give you some numbers that then you can record and, and present to your doctor and explain to them what you did. And most of the rheumatologists out there understand what a rapid three is. And they'll plug that into their computer and be able to then speak to you about ways that they can work around that. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide and then we'll discuss the results of the poll. All right, so what are, uh, and I lost my poll, where did the poll results go? Oh, go there. All right. So what are the uh, areas that you currently track? And so it looks like that uh, about a third of people haven't actually started tracking anything yet. And that is okay. This is a good way to start. Um, and then it looks like the remaining 65% of you to track at least something. My guess is that many of you track more than one thing. Um, but the most common looks to be about the amount of activity and physical uh, amount of physical activity and exercise that you do. And these are probably a lot of step counters and things like that. 
uh, pain levels, uh, a few of you check calories, some do sleep and water intake. So again, I think this is a great, nice, well-rounded group, and I, I look forward to introducing some of the other things we can talk about uh, as far as uh, health tracking moving forward. So, um, <clears throat> what kind of exercise do I have here? I'm just trying to remember here. So, did we do a, I can't remember, Christine, did we do a whiteboard with this one or do with just the goal set? Or anybody want to share anything in the chat about what they, uh, specific tools that they have discovered? I think we just do the um, whiteboard with the goal setting, Dr. Cole. All right, that's fine. Right. Yeah. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll start right into that then. So goal setting. So one of the things that I like to, to tell patients and, and the Arthritis Foundation is a champion of this is um, have, have some meaningful goals in your life because it really kind of gives you that, you know, encouragement to, to move forward and, and accomplish things. And it's that sense of accomplishment once you've achieved these goals that really are some of the most important things in life that we can do for ourselves. And so what we're going to do now is an exercise uh, called uh, goal setting, and but keep it relevant to patients when, and family members with rheumatoid arthritis. So let's next slide. So first of all, I want to think about what are the different kinds of goals that exist? And, and you don't have to have all of these, but it's good to at least pick a couple um, and understand that there's different things out there that, that qualify for a goal. So there's both personal goals as well as medical goals. <laughs> Examples of personal goals would be continuing a hobby if you're into art or something like that, traveling, working and volunteering your time, maybe increasing physical activity. These are all good personal goals. And then there's also medical goals that you should continue to, to work with your clinician is reducing the number of joints affected by arthritis, uh, having a better plan for adherence to medication if it's complicated, uh, improving your dialogue with your clinician and, and finding out really what's a, a good way to improve upon that. So these are all potential kinds of goals that exist out there. But the next slide I'm going to show you is really a mnemonic that helps you think about how to better define the goal so that it has a real high impact and a high probability then of success. And that's to set what we call a SMART goal. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. So what I mean by that is that if I just said, oh, you know, my goal is to uh, lose weight. Well, that's not really specific. Maybe you want to say how much weight you want to lose. Um, and then measurable, meaning how are you going to do it? Do you have a scale? Are you going to weigh yourself weekly and keep progress reports? Is it attainable? I mean, if you weigh 130 pounds and you say you want to lose 50 pounds, is that really attainable? Think about what is a realistic goal that you know that you can do and it's within reach because you want to make something that you can then at the end of it say, I did it. Make sure it's relevant to you, right? I mean, if you have a goal of doing something that you've never done before, but really doesn't have much meaning to you either, you're most likely to really kind of put all your effort into it. And finally, time back. Set a time to make this goal achievable. If you wanted to lose weight, you wanted to say, I want to do it within six months or something like that. So then you'd have a, an endpoint that you can work towards achieving. <clears throat> so if we go to the next slide, what I think we're going to do here is um, asks in the chat window, anybody have a smart goal that they want to share and we can kind of talk about it? Yes. Yeah, so go ahead and type in the Q&A function, um, any goals that you have. Um, and while they do that, Dr. Collins, let's, let's kind of run through this exercise, you and I, um, yeah. because it, it, one of the age old favorites, and you already kind of mentioned it is I want to exercise more, uh, or I want to be more active, right? So how can we take that as a goal and turn it into a smart goal? <clears throat> well, so the first, let's just kind of go through the mnemonics, right? So mm -hmm. specific. <clears throat> So first of all, when I say specific, I, I think about, well, first of all, what is the definition of exercise that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, I think that you need to maybe narrow it down a little bit to perhaps a specific type of exercise to make it a, a smart goal. So instead of saying, I want to go to the, the gym more, you say, I want to go to the gym and use, uh, you know, the elliptical machine. Uh, and that's, that's the specific goal with, without pain, mm -hmm. right? All right. Is it measurable? Sure. Right. So that's the, the M and smart. So you can track how often you go to the gym and how often you use the elliptical machine. And you've got health trackers, you've got all sorts of things, and just a calendar. And so you can keep track of all these things. And maybe you can add in there, well, maybe I wanted to go there at least two times a week. Mm -hmm. And so now you've added a measurable component to this goal. Is it attainable? Well, first of all, do you have access to this elliptical mm -hmm. machine and gym, right? Um, if you don't, then maybe the goal needs to be adjusted to what is within your ability to do as far as the exercise that you want to do. Mm -hmm. In this case, we'll assume that it is. Is it relevant? Well, sure. Everyone feels the importance of exercise is relevant. And so I do think that that is a, a, a decent, relevant component to this goal. Finally, time bound. And so time bound, is a, it's, a, it's up to you to interpret. Um, you can say that um, I want to be in the habit of going twice a week within three months from now. And so you set now for three months to look at your calendar and say, am I consistently going two times a week and using the elliptical machine? And so now it's time. Mm -hmm. So the goal went from, I want to exercise more now to, I would like to go to the gym and use the elliptical machine at least twice a week um, and be consistent with this at least three months from today. That's great. That makes sense. Um... I think the attainable, you mentioned, you know, do you have access to a gym? Um, but also even is it attainable for you specifically in your body, I think is important to think about, right? When yeah. you're setting these no, goals. you got a point. If you have uh, your arthritis is poorly controlled and you don't feel that um, you can do that, then this becomes, you know, a, a secondary goal is to get to the point where you you have access internally to do this, whether or not mm -hmm. it's, it's medical, whether or not it's uh, a, a whole sorts of other, other things that can affect whether or not you can get to the gym. Mm -hmm. um, or so even if you need to get to the gym, you can just walk. Like I said, right. you work within the medical confines um, to improve the, and optimize your healthcare, uh, as well as do other things that make this goal of exercise at least a more specific and, and measurable. Mm -hmm. So we have one, a new goal. I want to lose 50 pounds. Yeah, I think we kind of brushed on that a mm -hmm. little bit. So the, the first um, one I would want to make sure is that it, it is specific, right? You want to lose 50 pounds, but you could add to that specificity um, by doing some of those measures of, of the smart mnemonic, right? So um, measurable would be that you're going to have a scale and you're going to measure yourself. It's attainable. If you feel that that is the right amount of weight for you to lose, and I have to trust you on that self-assessment, then it's attainable. Is it relevant? I'm sure it is. But it's the time bound. This is where I think these kinds of um, goals are need to be really focused. Because if you just say, I want to lose 50 pounds without really identifying how you're going to do it, um, are you going to try to lose a certain amount per week? Um, or are you going to give yourself, you know, credits along the way, and mm -hmm. stuff to help you do this? Because 50 pounds, it's, it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you should, you know, look at maybe breaking that up a little bit. Maybe instead of saying, yeah. I want to lose 50 pounds, if you say, eventually I want to lose 50 pounds, but right now I just want to lose 10 pounds in the next month or two months. Uh, and I'm going to, and then you're going to think about how are you going to do it, right? That's the 
measurable and attainable part is, you know, are you going to do this through diet and exercise? You have to think about these goals and, and actually put them all out there and spell them all out if you're going to have a, a high success in doing this. So again, the smart ones, you don't always have to have all the five letters, but the, the, the purpose of the exercise is to make you realize that lofty goals are, are great. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're too lofty and not well thought out, um, they tend to not get accomplished. And so make them smaller, make them relatable, make them attainable, um, and really think about how you're going to do. Great. I think we're going to move on to the next part, but I wanted to read just um, two that I spotted that were specific and, and they seem to be on track. One said, uh, walking meditation for five minutes after lunch on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and track it in my to-do list for the week. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. Another said, my goal is to go to Yellowstone National Park and be able to hike by next summer. So again, we've got that time frame in there as well. Yeah. But I think uh, you got to also add into that one. Oh, well, are you a hiker or do you, <laughs> can you hike? Maybe you need to start walking around the block a little mm -hmm. bit, invest in some good shoes, pick the trail very carefully. Yellowstone's mm -hmm. got some crazy cliffs out there. You want to go to the areas that you know that you can handle. So think about all these things and, and make it fun, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I would love to go to Yellowstone and go hiking, plan it out, really yeah. think about how you're going to get there. Maybe it starts with walking to the mailbox, you know, four times Absolutely. a week. Absolutely. Yeah. So wonderful. All right. Well, let's let you take it back over. All right. So if we move on to the next slide. So everyone has a smartphone these days, right? And so there's an app for that, right? There's a picture. It looks like an iPhone, I think, but I'm sure it's with all the major platforms. Um, so this is a new app from the Arthritis Foundation called Vim. Uh, and Vim is designed as energy and enthusiasm, but you know, obviously it can be a lot more, but it provides a lot of resources um, at your fingertips that are there through the Arthritis Foundation. It helps you with goal setting, and achievable, even just small six week long goals uh, and helps you do these little celebrations with those small wins that add up to big victories. Um, go to the next slide. All right, so moving on, let's talk about communication with your uh, healthcare provider. I, I, I love this part of the talk because I think it's um, very impactful about what you can get out of your office visits. And so, you know, you, most of you have, have now been with your doctors, I'm, I'm assuming for a little while, and half the audience had their arthritis for at least two years or more. And so I think the, the you probably have had both good visits and bad visits. And um, and those bad visits, sometimes it's hard to put a finger on why it is, but I can tell you universally, it's always because they seem that you don't have enough time to talk about everything you want to talk with your doctor. And unfortunately, uh, managed healthcare, they are required to, to, to oftentimes limit visits to 15 minutes or less. Uh, and what a lot of people don't realize is that also includes behind the scene. Uh, documentation and everything as well. And so sometimes you may only seemingly get five minutes from your doctor and it seems to be uh, very impactful about how you feel about your healthcare sometimes. So um, I'm gonna walk you through some things that, that you can do ahead of time that, um, and as long as you can communicate your doctor, your intention to wanna to have time to protect the time to discuss with them is gonna make all these visits seem a whole lot better. So if we go to the first slide. So the things that, and you don't have to do all of these, but things that uh, I always like to know about my patients, um, because honestly, you, you, you guys know your body better than anything, right? And you can come in and I can mash my fingers on your joints and tell if they're swollen, but what really is impactful is knowing how your arthritis is impacting your daily life. And so just being able to have written down something to be, you know, arth docs, my arthritis has been great, no problems, or the opposite. Arthritis has been bad enough that it's really affecting my daily life. And even just simple one sentence statements like that can really help drive the, the tone of the rest of the conversation of that visit. Because if I know it's really affecting your life, I know that that's, we need to do better for you. 
Um, you can expand upon how it affects personal relationships. Um, <clears throat> when I talk about medicines, be, be honest. That is, I, I will never judge. Life is hard. Um, taking meds, especially a lot of them, uh, is even harder. Um, and so if, if you're occasionally missing some, or maybe you were having side effects and you decided to stop, please don't be afraid to tell your physician because if we're under the assumption that you are taking it as you're supposed to, then we may make the wrong choices around how to manage things if things aren't going well. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, if you really are taking things the way they are, then knowing that, having that honest conversation, being like, listen, I'm, I swear up and down, I'm taking things like you told me to, then those conversations really need to happen about how we can better change the things that we're doing. Um, if you feel like sharing some of the goals that you set yourself, I love hearing about this from my patients. It really helps provide a, a personal connection. I generally jot these things down the note. And so when you come back, I'm asking how these goals are going. Um, but I, I think they're good and they can, it's always good to share some of the, what you're trying to do for yourself. Um, always talk about what are some obstacles that are preventing you from achieving some of your goals, right? If you're having problems at home, at work, whatever, if it's your medical, let us know and, and we'll either give you that sympathetic ear or perhaps provide some tips that can help you through it. Um, finally, what you've done or plan on doing to overcome any of those obstacles. And again, knowing that you've got an idea, it's the first step is being able to talk about them to your clinician for sure. <clears throat> so next slide. As I said before, be upfront. Um, when you come into your doctor's office and you know you, you have a list of something, um, before the doctor even sometimes starts, you've done your greetings and you say, hey doc, I, I know you've got what you need to do uh, on your exam and your uh, history taking the day, but I've got just a few questions that I wanna make sure we reserve time for. Um, and the doctor will almost always be respectful of that. He or she will be, you know what, no problem. Let's, let me go through my little checklist. We'll do our exam and then I will make sure we have some time to talk about some of these things. As I said before, be completely honest and open and be assertive. You know, if the doctor says, well, I don't really have time for this and to say, well, when will you have time? I understand maybe you're, you're busy today. Can I schedule an appointment with you next week to cover what we're not gonna get to today? Don't let them uh, to write you off and be like, no, don't. Don't do that. If you have a question you want to talk about, it, it's your right to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, so any questions about that? I think the next slide is really just a, a review and, and I would love to take some Q&A around either or things that you think you should be doing or have questions around uh, communication with your healthcare provider. Um, so we did have a couple questions. I don't see any quite about the healthcare providers yet. So maybe they're still typing those in. Um, but I, I love that comment about being assertive because I think that some patients might, might feel like, well, maybe this question is wasting my doctor's time. And I think your, your point there is you're never wasting that doctor's time if it's going to help benefit your health. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, again, not everyone has um, great bedside manner and that's just, part of the course. Um, but almost every doctor out there is competent and has gone through, you know, the, the reason you become a rheumatologist is because you enjoy long-term patient connections, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to be a surgeon or a radiologist, we actually never really talk to people, that's fine. But rheumatologists, as a profession, we go into this because we like people, right? Mm -hmm. We love talking to and getting to know and establishing long relationships. I, I've ushered many babies through from my lupus mommies and, and had patients from the NIH follow me to the Washington Hospital Center and I had connections that lasted 20 years plus. And so um, it's what we enjoy in the field. And so I think that lends itself to being great in conversation of by and large, right? Mm -hmm. I, if you have a great rheumatologist, stick with them. If you don't, you know, 
it's okay to, to get another from the ball. Just <laughs> it's okay to shop around. Yeah. Be assertive, <laughs> right? Be yes. assertive. If you're not getting what you want out of it, your rheumatologist should be um, a partner in mm-hmm. this and never an obstacle. Okay. So let's get to a couple questions. Um, these are, um, we're going to backtrack a little bit to some of these goals and just our ability to complete them. And then we'll get into a question about, uh, for a doctor, um, a goal to walk more is nice. Um, for this person, they're saying take taking more steps increases their foot, ankle, and shin pain from a level seven to a 10. So they end up wanting to use a wheelchair even more. Is there a threshold where your pain is just too severe to, to really accomplish some of these goals? How should you adjust that goal? This, this particular person is saying they don't think their methotrexate is helping. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's part of understanding pain is understanding where the pain comes from and why you're having pain. Mm -hmm. Um, And so certainly there are elements within rheumatoid arthritis that could and should be able to be addressed by the the current armamentarium that we have. But understand that that's not the only player, unfortunately, in a lot of people. And so, especially around the ankles, if um, you know, you've, you've had a lot of damage over time, you could have what we just call mechanical pain left over there that even in the absence of inflammation, bone grinding on bone, for example, is gonna hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in those kinds of circumstances, yeah, a goal of walking more is not going to be as easily attainable as doing something else that maybe involves more upper body or something like that. I mean, there's still exercise that can be done. But make sure you understand why you're having that ankle pain, right? Mm-hmm. If, if it's only the ankles that are hurting and it's only after you've been doing walking, that to me sounds like a lot of mechanical kind of things. If the ankles are just a, a larger part of an entire problem of, of painful, swollen joints, then you're right, methotrexate may not be working. Mm-hmm. But have that conversation with your doctor to clarify, doc, I feel fine everywhere else, but my ankles, what's wrong with my ankles? And they'll talk to you, maybe they'll show you some x-rays, they'll walk you through why that is. Mm-hmm. And maybe that can help you better understand what's going on. Okay, great. Um, we had another one, I love gardening. Um, and knitting, I can't do it as much because of joint swelling and fingers. Should I keep doing these activities for just shorter periods of time, um, even when I'm not so flexible? Yeah, I don't think gardening is one of those high impact exercises that is going to cause damage. I think as long as you find enjoyment in it, um, then it's still okay to do even in smaller amounts. I think, you know, life pleasures, um, are, are very important <laughs> in the world we live in today, especially. Um, make sure, again, have that conversation. Is it because uh, arthritis generally can be controlled better that you're having problems with extended gardening? Or mm-hmm. um, is there some other factor that's going on? Again, you can get osteoarthritis in your fingers as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and perhaps there's something you can do about that. Nice hot paraffin bath or something like that. So again, I, I think it's just good to understand from your doctor why they also think that you're having because everyone's an individual and you have to know the whole clinical picture so for me to postulate why your hands are hurting that say it's only due to rheumatoid is i I can't so but have a have an honest conversation have them really explain to you what's going on um and talk to them about the same thing you just said i would like to garden more it hurts a little bit much don't be afraid to garden you're not going to do damage gardening um but uh, if you want to do more of it, then kind of get to the, the, the base understanding of what's the limitation. Okay. Um, the questions for doctors. What types, of, what types of things should my doctor know before a diagnosis is made? So what information does that doctor need before they make a diagnosis? So, yeah. All right. So for rheumatoid arthritis, um, well, the way that most rheumatology works is um, there's very few things in rheumatology that are one test or, or one feature that it can't be anything else. And so we, what we do in rheumatology a lot is uh, put together large complex puzzles. Um, every piece of the puzzle helps paint a picture of what's going on and rheumatoid arthritis is no different. And so the elements of rheumatoid arthritis that paint a clinical picture of RA include the distribution uh, and types of joints that are involved, uh, the age at which is, this has been happening in you, um, the 
history of uh, morning stiffness that gets better throughout the day sometimes mm -hmm. because that's a little bit atypical for a mechanical arthritis that's more inflammatory. Uh, questions around extra articular signs, you know, obviously the, the clinical exam is very important. Family history is very important. Um, whether or not you had a history of smoking before, we know cigarette smoking uh, carries an independent risk factor for the development of rheumatoid arthritis. So even if you don't smoke now, telling your doctor that you used to smoke. Uh, and then of course the blood tests, right? There are some very good markers that uh, around 85% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis have, it's called the CCP antibody and the rheumatoid factor. Uh, but that means about 15% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis don't. So it's not mm. a hundred percent. Uh, and then <clears throat> there are other diseases for which those blood tests can be positive. But again, you put it all in the right clinical picture, then it points to a diagnosis of rheumatoid. Okay. A uh, big question here. Is it ever okay to disagree with my doctor? Um, this particular patient says he's insisting on giving methotrexate as an injection, but I keep saying no, because my ESR and CRP are well within limits. Yeah. So that's a tough one. It's always okay to disagree. My bigger suggestion would be to make them help you understand why they insist on it, right? Maybe there's a very good reason. Maybe they say, well, the only reason that they're normal is because I'm doing this, so I have to keep doing it. But perhaps we can back off the dose or switch to orals or something and see what happens. My guess is that you just needs to be better communication with your doctor. If you don't understand or disagree why they're doing something, make them explain it to you mm -hmm. to the point that you're comfortable with it. And if you're still not comfortable with it, work with them to find an amicable solution that they can agree with and that you can agree with. But most doctors aren't doing something out there just out of habit. They're doing it because they understand the disease and you. And so they should, you should understand why they're doing it. If they're not, then you just need to have a, 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 an in-depth conversation, uh, even schedule an appointment just to have that conversation and say, help me understand what and why we're doing what we're doing. Okay. Um, this next one, it's one long question, but I'm actually going to break it into two because I think there's a good point in the second half of this. Um, it says, I was diagnosed with RA, osteoarthritis, and carpal tunnel. When I'm having symptoms, how can I tell which one is causing the pain? Yeah. So uh, carpal tunnel is going to be really limited to um, the nerve kind of pain. So what carpal tunnel is, is there's a, a tendon sheath right around the base of the wrist that several important nerves kind of run through. When that uh, carpal tunnel sheath gets inflamed, whether or not from repetitive stress, sometimes even rheumatoid can do it a little bit, uh, it pinches that nerve and you're gonna feel tingling and numbness, generally mm -hmm. in uh, these three fingers, the thumb first and, and this finger. Generally it spares these two, the nerve sheath travels uh, at a different place, but you'll get your fung uh, in those areas. So if you feel that kind of tingling, numbing and stuff like that, that's probably the carpal tunnel. Now, the difference between OA and RA is gonna be at least in the hands of the distribution of where the pain is. So most rheumatoid arthritis in the fingers, it's gonna be this joint and the knuckle mm -hmm. and very rarely at the tip. Whereas osteoarthritis tends to be at the tip and this joint, but very rarely the knuckle. Okay? okay. And also the base of the thumb is also very osteoarthritis. Okay. So if you're having a lot of pain, not much swelling, it's mostly at the base of the thumb, maybe a little bit the tips of the fingers, that's probably OA. If it's more along the knuckles, maybe at the top of the wrist and there's some swelling and bogginess when you push it, that's probably rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So the second part of that question that I wanted to touch on, because I think there's another question here for you. Um, this one said with my rheumatologist, there's a language barrier. I've tried to switch, but because I'm established, no new rheumatologist will take me on as a patient. I know the arthritis foundation has resources to help you find a doctor. There's even a helpline, you know, they can help with different things there. Um, but do you have suggestions if, if a patient is kind of locked into their doctor a little bit and you know, what would you say to a patient that might be in that situation? 
So sometimes calling the insurance helps um, and explaining them. You call your insurer and explain to them why that you're looking for a different doctor. And most of the time they'll approve you for that. And then when you call the office, the doctor to schedule an appointment, you explain what's going on. I think most of them are going to be sympathetic, especially mm -hmm. if then they're able to speak the same language that you do. Um, I don't think anyone, I, I've never been offended if a patient left me to go to somebody else. I understand it happens. And I certainly have absorbed patients who came in from other doctors. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And so anyone that says that, you know, nobody will take an established patient. It's not necessarily true. I mean, it, it, you have to be able to go to a doctor where you can communicate with. Mm -hmm. And so um, work with your insurer, find whom else is on your plan, call that group and say, I know I've been with this other doctor for a while, but this isn't working and here's why. They'll mm -hmm. take it, I'm sure. Okay, very good. And the same situation, not even when there isn't a language barrier, just, just a barrier. Yeah. And maybe we just I know, don't sometimes there's a personality barrier. Listen, yeah, you know, yeah. so you want to be able to trust and, and be able to communicate with that doctor. Um, is how safe is methotrexate in the long term? Can it cause heart and liver issues? Should I switch to another drug, even though it's working well for me? Yeah. So um there is a literature around safety concerns of methotrexate and liver toxicity after several decades of use. Most of that was generated in a disease called psoriasis, where you have to have higher doses of methotrexate. And some of the way the mechanism of disease works made it particularly problematic. The truth is that we've been using methotrexate to help treat rheumatoid arthritis for 50 or 60 years. Um, and that, you know, there's, of course, a small chance that somebody is going to have toxicity issues. Um, not so much, uh, I guess liver probably is the most common. Lung is extremely uncommon, generally something that happens very early. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, it is one of those things in general. I, I tend to be a minimalist when I can. So if you've been on methotrexate for 20 years and you're doing great, I try to go to the minimal effective dose that keeps you doing great, right? Because there's a balance between inflammation and medication risk. It's much higher risk to have active inflammation, systemic inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis can cause than it is to be on what it really is an effectively safe drug for the vast majority of people who take it. That being said, your doctor is always going to check blood work when you're on methotrexate. Is there a correlation concern. between methotrexate and high cholesterol or even Not RA really. and high cholesterol? <laughs> yes, there is a correlation between inflammation and high cholesterol. Okay. And if you get your inflammation under control, cholesterol tends to go down. All right. That makes sense. Would you recommend an additional booster, a fifth COVID shot? They've already had four for being immunocompromised and they flared after their second shot. Um, so I think that's a tough one. I, I don't know the nature of the flare, the nature mm -hmm. of the, the type of shot they got. I, it, it is generally advisable um, that if you are on immunosuppressive meds at the time of a vaccination, this goes for any vaccination, mm -hmm. you tend to not mount as good a response. Um, and so you may be kind of quote unquote under vaccinated. Um, especially in some of the certain drugs like uh, rituximab. That being said, um, you know, talk to your doctor about what they think for you and your individual plan and situation and, you know, your risk factors for going out there. Um, I, you know, we, they have the new BA2 variant, which is starting to make an increase back in the United States. And so it is uh, something to be aware of that that is out there. And certainly most of the country has backed away from um, mitigation strategies. So, you know, going to a grocery store isn't as safe uh, as it used to be. Um, and if you're still very concerned about catching COVID, which I'm sure everybody is, um, you know, invest in, don't do the cloth napkins, do some of the medical grade napkins. You can order them on the Amazon. The KN95s are good. Even just mm -hmm. the medical ones that your, your nurse and doctors wear um, when they see you are, 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 are decently protective. I mean, most of the masks wearing early on was to not share and spread, but the medical ones are actually good about keeping it from you. Um, okay. but yeah, just talk to your doctor and see if, um, if that's something that they recommend. And also, I know there's probably a ton of arthritis patients on here right now that are considering a fourth shot, a fifth shot, something like that. 
Um, yeah. Also check with your doctor to see if you need to stop medication, right? Because I think the protocols have kind of changed over the last two years on what medications you have to stop yeah, or don't yeah, stop. Yeah, it used to be that you should uh, stop methotrexate but not stop Plaquenil, mm -hmm. hold mm -hmm. some sort. Again, a lot of it is very personalized, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you have a very brittle uh, arthritis and stopping a dose is going to cause you a huge flare, and I wouldn't stop it. <laughs> so it's very individual. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Um, could you discuss step therapy? I had a very bad experience with it and I'd be interested to hear any advice you might have. Thank you. Uh, so it's been a while since I've heard of step therapy. And what I think you're probably referring to is the concept of uh, adding on multiple oral DMARDs before you get to a biologic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's certainly in Europe, a more cost saving kind of a strategy. And it certainly works. I think there's a lot to be said about Pilbert. Um, and the more you kind of have to swallow stuff, the more side effects you tend to get. I do think step therapy can be helpful for a lot of things uh, related to rheumatoid arthritis. I just think there's a lot newer, better products out there that are kind of slowly taking the place of step therapy. So mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it's bad. It's, it's, it's well-studied, vetted for effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, I just think there's newer ways. Okay. Best pain meds for arthritis. Is medical marijuana a good alternative? I can tell you what's not good. So um, in general, if you're having to take a lot of pain meds for your rheumatoid arthritis, you need to have better rheumatoid arthritis control. I actually have patients, uh, I mean, most patients end up being on ibuprofen or another non mm -hmm. like Aleve. Mm -hmm. uh, I use that as a surrogate marker to tell me how well I'm doing. I'm like, well, how much Aleve are you taking? Oh, I'm only taking <laughs> one or two a week. Oh, that's nice, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm popping four a day. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, so non-steroidals tend to be the most common. Tylenol is very safe. Avoid opioids like the plague. So first mm -hmm. of all, they don't work that way. So uh, opioids work for a pain signal that's not really related to the inflammation. They can take the edge off, but they just, they cause <laughs> way more problems than they do. Mm -hmm. Finally, medical marijuana, you know, it's a personal choice. I, um, there was an interesting abstract that came out a few years ago. It was in lupus, but they were trying to determine if medical marijuana helped patients with their disease. And what they actually found is the patients of medical marijuana did worse, but it wasn't because the medical marijuana made them worse. They just got so high, they forgot to take their lupus meds. <laughs> so know yourself, know your state, know your doctor. <laughs> um, and those are conversations that you can have. I've, I've had patients that swore by it and I've had patients that said it didn't do anything. So mm -hmm. it's okay. Uh, what can I do when OTC pain medication does not help and the rheumatologist refuses to prescribe muscle relaxer and pain medication that works? So kind of related. So there, there, there. are, um, uh, doctors called pain management specialists. Um, if uh, your rheumatoid, if your rheumatologist is uncomfortable prescribing some of the mm -hmm. bigger guns, when, and that's fair. I think that it's just a, a slippery slope that a lot of rheumatologists don't like to go down. Uh, they refer, refer out to something called pain management. Mm -hmm. Recognize that things like muscle relaxers and, and more potent pain meds are often just a reflection of the overall control of your arthritis. And and that, you know, if it's not rheumatoid, you're dealing with a different type of pain, well, then try to figure out what that pain is and have a conversation around it. And if it's fibromyalgia, or if it's something else, maybe things like physical therapy and mm -hmm. looking into sleep hygiene and all these other things that are kind of more on the, on the periphery can actually make some of those elements better. If it's the RA, he's got to get better rheumatoid arthritis control. Going back to physical therapy, you mentioned physical therapy. Um, yeah when should you see a physical therapist and should you talk to your rheumatologist before you do? Um, so I like it when my patients uh, saw physical therapy. Um, it didn't so much matter that you had to wait until you had like an injury to do it, because I do think that there's mm -hmm. value in preventative physical therapy, meaning core strengthening and mm -hmm. making sure that you're in as good a physical shape as you can be. It helps actually prevent injury a lot. 
So, um, and I liked it when they told me they did because I like to be in concert and, and send messages back and forth with a therapist or sometimes being offered a recommend a good therapist whom I know works with rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. patients. It, it's a different kind of therapy, right? You need to be a little more hands-on, uh, need a little, a little bit softer touch sometimes, avoidance of certain high impact things. Uh, and so a good physical therapist who works with RA is, is great. Um, and I would go as much as your insurance permits. Us. <laughs> <laughs> Look at your benefit package. If you get, you know, 12 visits a year, make sure you don't lose them. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Use every last cent of that. Um, so another one here, I'm in my early thirties and my partner and I are beginning to discuss having a family. I'm interested in hearing more about the specific challenges of pregnancy and child rearing as an RA patient. I'm worried about the physical stress on my body and joints, the impact of stress and fatigue, et cetera. How does one begin to navigate these specific challenges? I'm also interested in hearing from Christina's experience as a mother with RA. I, I was actually going to lead with the last <laughs> one, right? I, the, honestly, the best advice you're going to get about being a, a mom with RA is to talk to moms with RA. Um, I, they will speak volumes more than I could. As a, as a doctor, my biggest concerns are going to be to make sure you're not on medications, which would be bad during pregnancy or breastfeeding, mm -hmm. uh, and to make sure that you are as good a condition as you can be for the pregnancy and the delivery. So, um, but beyond the stresses and all the other things, I'll talk to moms. There's got to be tons of you guys out there. I mean, literally, RA does not affect fertility at all. Mm -hmm. So that shouldn't be the problem. <laughs> yes, uh, RA does not, but stress does and when your body is in stress i learned personally when your body of is in stress it, it can be more yes. difficult yeah um but just to try to jump in there a little bit um how do you navigate those specific challenges i would say exactly what dr collins said and and that's find other moms um or other moms that are currently going through it uh pick their brain um there in, and talk to your doctor beforehand. Like you said, you want to make sure you're not on any medication that could potentially hurt the baby. Um, but, uh, if you're lucky, <laughs> you might experience a little bit of remission during pregnancy and then immediately get back on board with your doctor because the pain will come back. Um, at least for most moms that I speak to. So, um, yeah, but uh, I would also recommend look up a Facebook group because there's a lot of Facebook groups for that as well. So, and good luck. <laughs> um, one patient says they could not tolerate first COVID shot alternatives and safety tips. Do you recommend, do you, I'm sorry, do you recommend evil, evil shield? I don't know how to pronounce that. Sorry. <laughs> evil shield. I honestly don't, I'm not sure what evil shield yeah. is. So I think it's, yeah, yeah. We talked a little bit earlier about the, the right kind of mask that you want to wear that actually protects you. That's the KN95. It's the Korean manufacturer of an N95. It has the same tri ply um, filter uh, ratio that, that keeps the COVID virus out. Um, and then, you know, talk to your doctor about alternative COVID uh, shots. Again, um, there's at least two different types, right? So there's the Johnson & Johnson, which is a vector adenoviral DNA virus. And then there's the Moderna and Pfizer, which are messenger RNA. Those tend to be the ones that have the highest potential for side effects when you get them. Um, but maybe the J&J &J shot would be better, better tolerated. And then I, I keep hearing that, you know, there's new ones still in development. They're looking at all their alternatives. So you may just have to wait until another one comes out. All right. Sounds good. Can vitamin deficiency aggravate rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, vitamin D, B12, et cetera? Are certain vitamins and supplements more beneficial in mitigating RA symptoms? Yeah. So um, we, we've done studies in the past that look at certain vitamin deficiencies and how they relate to autoimmunity. Uh, vitamin D is one of them that patients with chronically low vitamin D tended to have a little poor uh, immune system. And when you have rheumatoid arthritis and things, it, it tends to be a, a little bit more of a problem. Um, so externally, a lot of the medications we also give can affect things like bone health. And if you have ever on prednisone, so vitamin supplements, especially calcium and vitamin D are incredibly important in those situations. Outside of that, there's not a lot of good studies that talk about anything outside of 
omega-3 fatty acids, which really aren't mm -hmm. a binary. But uh, um, I think that in general, healthy supplements are fine. Uh, I think if you have a vitamin D deficiency, you got to understand why. Right? Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it, is this vitamin D and you're not getting enough sun? Then take supplemental vitamin D. Is it B12 deficiency? Well, check. It could be a, a hematologic issue, but you can take B12 as well. So just make sure that you're in a healthy balance. That's my best advice. That makes sense. Um, elevated liver enzymes and RA medications. What do you, yeah. what should you watch out for and which medications tend to cause this? Honestly, anything that you just swallow has the potential to cause something in the liver because it goes through something called a first pass effect. The biggest uh, player probably is methotrexate. We talked about this earlier. Um, not everybody, but a small percentage of patients can get liver irritation that uh, most of the time, you know, we see it far in advance of it causing chronic liver toxicity. One of the reasons why you're on methotrexate that you get blood drawn every three to six months is to look for this very problem. Um, it's a very slow process, meaning that it would take years of liver irritation to cause irreplaceable liver damage. Mm. Um, and so if what we look for are these things called transaminitis, this is AST and ALT. When they go about three times the upper limit of normal and you're on methotrexate, then we back off or we stop it because that's, that becomes the big code word. Um, but beyond that, just if you're on methotrexate, just make sure your doctor is looking at your blood liver enzymes at least every three to six months because um, that's how they catch it early enough to, so that it doesn't cause any problems. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of others. Maybe the jacks can in rare occasion because they're a swallow as well. Yeah, it's important though to get that blood work done when your doctor asks for it though <laughs> so they can yeah, check for great. those things. All right. Um, I'm not seeing another question here. Let me see. Oh, wait, here we go. How do you navigate pain management uh, if a, when a pain management specialist refuses to continue prescription of pain medications? The specialist has also said to, said to discontinue physical therapy to prevent further inflammation or symptoms. They're only willing to offer steroid shots, but my rheumatologist said it's bad to be on steroids long term. Currently, I'm on a biologic, uh, Remicade. Um, blood work still shows increased inflammation. Mm -hmm. A lot of my guess to that is one. the, <laughs> the steroid. The, my guess is the steroid shots are probably in the joints and stuff. The rheumatologist mm -hmm. is correct that long-term steroids are are bad, but most of that is is directed at um, prednisone, which is the daily oral prednisone mm -hmm. pill, uh, and mostly at doses greater than around five to seven and a half milligrams a day. That's certainly going to be problematic. The shots, you know. It depends on where the shots are going if, and the volume and the frequency that they're being given. Uh, I'm less concerned around long-term steroid uh, consequences. The, the other question about you know, refusing to give you some of these other things, I, again, it's one of those, you have to have a conversation to understand why. Mm -hmm. And if they, they won't, what can they do for you that's going to help right i mean if their job as a, as a pain manager specialist to help you deal with pain to mm -hmm. work with me what can i do explain to me why i can't do this explain to me why would you won't do that and if you have a conversation and you're willing to communicate when they're sorry they're willing to communicate and are able to articulate it then you generally have a better sense and a better understanding of what's going on in your body at the end of the day, though, you don't have a good relationship with a pain management specialist, and I, I know they get this a lot because a lot of people don't like their pain management specialist decisions. You can find another one, too. So I just want you to be comfortable with the decision making that's been going on, that you're a part of it as much as possible, um, and that there's understanding of all the decisions that are being made. It's kind of vague recommendations, but it's the best I can do from this side of the ocean. Okay. <laughs> Great. A couple more questions here. My RA went undiagnosed for several years. This led to joint damage in my foot, shoulder, neck. I've had to have three surgeries in the last three years. Is it harder to manage RA when you are going through surgery? How can I prevent further damage and surgeries? Yeah. So the, the best thing you can do is, is to get on those potent drugs, right? So one of the things that we've learned about the rheumatoid arthritis is that, um, People who develop damage from the rheumatoid arthritis, if continued under or untreated, will continue to develop more damage, right? 
So there's a subset of people with rheumatoid arthritis that are very, very slow. Maybe they'll never get an erosion or damage. And those are the kind of people that methotrexate works just fine for. But if you've had a lot of very bad damage related to unpreviously diagnosed, the best thing you can do for it is get on therapy and make sure it's effective Mm. uh, and controlling all that inflammation. Um, surgery itself obviously is very stressful. You want to make sure that most, most orthopedists don't like to do surgery on active rheumatoid arthritis patients. And so they'll make them, they'll work with the rheumatologist to make sure things are very quiet before they do another surgery. So just make sure that RA is under control. Okay. Um, I think this is going to be our final question of the evening here. We yeah. have some more to share. Um, so don't, don't go anywhere. Uh, black box warnings and medications, how worried should we be? So here we're talking about medications like maybe Zelgians, um, and concerns with clotting. Yeah. So, uh, boxed warnings are part and parcel of a lot of medicines in rheumatology. Um, a boxed warning is something that is important enough that it is conveyed to the audience or the patient with every communication that happens commercially. Um, for example, if you watch TV, uh, you see a commercial for Zelljans, by law, they have to explain what the, is in the boxed warning. And it's just for fair and balanced and understanding the risks of other medications. What a boxed warning isn't good for, unfortunately, is telling you the likelihood of some <laughs> of these things. Um, they are generally boxed because they're serious when they occur. But they are generally and, and thankfully very, very rare. Not that means they don't happen. They wouldn't have a box warning if it didn't happen. But it generally implies that it's just something to be aware of. Talk to your doctor if you have other risk factors, like in the case of Zelgens, if you have other risk factors for blood clots, you want to make sure that you have that conversation. Know what the signs and symptoms of a blood clot would look like, and you'd have those conversations. So it's really just. Mm-hmm. The more you know about what you're taking, um, first of all, it'll the, these package inserts read like Stephen King horror stories. They're awful. But recognize that they're there just because you have the right to know uh, and you should and, 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 and make a point to ask questions about anything you're uncomfortable about. Your clinician should know these mm-hmm. well and be able to explain them all to you. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Collins, thank you again for lending your time and expertise tonight. Um, I'm sure you you had so much to share, so I'm sure you're probably tired now. <laughs> That's believe, okay. Yeah, but I believe I can speak on behalf of our audience that we are all walking away with a renewed sense of confidence and empowerment to take control of our arthritis. So thank you so much. It, it was my it, pleasure. It's my pleasure. I know we've got a few more slides, but I think we you're going to walk me through those. Absolutely. So in the last hour, we've learned about so much, including the health effects of RA, possible treatments, plus how to track symptoms, set goals effectively, and how to communicate with your doctor. And even though I've had RA for some time now, I know I myself learned a lot this evening. Putting it all together, though, um, here are some common themes from today that can help you take control of your arthritis. So um, some of the things we discussed tonight, again, better understanding of your condition, partnering with your healthcare provider, taking action, and then connecting and sharing your progress. Um, Moving to the next slide here, just as a reminder, the Arthritis Foundation offers several resources to help you stay on track and achieve your goals. Um, We have, you can join a support group of people who can hold you accountable. This is a great way to help you follow through with these new goals that you've been setting. Our online community forums can also connect you with peers and experts, including healthcare providers that you can ask questions and share experiences. I can also tell you that being connected with other peers will help you set attainable goals, not just the goals we see on fitness apps, but goals like we see in the VIM app that are more attainable for arthritis patients. The next slide, we also have uh, support groups, virtual and in person, to help you feel more connected to the people who understand what you're going through. 
Like the online forum, these support groups host quarterly informational events on various or various arthritis management topics, including sleep, nutrition, alternative therapies. You can learn more about support groups and the online community by going to liveyes.arthritis.org. If you ever feel overwhelmed or have a question that you need help with right away, you can absolutely call the Arthritis Foundation helpline. I mentioned this actually earlier when Dr. Collins was answering some questions. This helpline can help you navigate the healthcare maze and even share resources about paying for treatment and care. Very, very important um, assistance that we have available there. Finally, if you have any additional questions or wish to seek more information about your disease, here are the three best places to start. Number one, talk to your rheumatologist. This is an obvious one, but remember, your doctor is your partner in your treatment journey and having an open and honest line of communication with him or her about various treatment strategies, complementary therapies, and pain management methods is the best place to start. Number two, visit arthritis.org. The arthritis.org, arthritisfoundation.org website is full of content tools, videos, various resources to help you take control of your arthritis and thrive. And I can tell you from personal experience, if you go to the arthritis.org website, type in any keyword that's on the top of your mind, you're going to find a ton of resources to answer those questions that you have. Number three is that you can find a local arthritis foundation market office. Your local market office can help connect you to programs and healthcare providers in your area, as well as connect you to people with arthritis in your local community and inform you about local educational events. And number four, for more information on how to navigate a new diagnosis, some of you had a new diagnosis on here, you might wanna consider purchasing the book Facing Rheumatoid Arthritis, a guide for patients and their family. Family, excuse me. This book is by Marcy B. Bolster, MD, and Theodore A. Stern, MD. Um, so wonderful book there that you can check out. Please note that in a couple days, you should receive a survey asking you about your experience on this session. Please take the time to fill that survey out honestly and completely so that we can best serve you in the future. Your feedback helps us improve educational events to help you with your needs and wants. Also, uh, a final reminder, the Arthritis Foundation has several resources and events coming up to help you manage your arthritis. We have several webinars. This includes a webinar on April 21st, Living Made Easier. Who doesn't want to attend that? <laughs> Arthritis Hacks for an at-home event. Uh, this, this session is led by two occupational therapists and will feature tips and tricks to help you better manage daily tasks, chores around the house, including grooming, gardening, home office, uh, tips, and much more. Upon registration, many of you had several questions about diet, complementary therapies, medical cannabis, emotional and mental health, uh, and more. So the Arthritis Foundation has an extensive archive of past webinars that directly addresses these topics. You can find that at arthritis dot org slash webinars. So those are going to be recordings of past topics. I encourage you to go check those out, especially if this is your very first arthritis foundation webinar, because there's probably a topic that you're going to want to have uh, watched that was held in the past. Um, keep in mind um, when you go to the webinar page that registration for all these events may not be open yet, but go ahead and save the date and check back regularly for when you can register. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, taking just 10 minutes to fill out the insights assessment can help you to help us, excuse me, develop programs that speak to what's important to you. So please take a few minutes and visit arthritis.org slash insights and take the assessment. Last but not least, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our sponsor, AbbVie, for providing support to help make this session happen. Thank you again to Abvi and thank you to Dr. Collins. And of course, thank you to you, the arthritis patients on here with us. Um, this is all for you and we want to create more programs like this for you in the future. So we truly appreciate you being here with us this evening. That is it for this session. We hope you have a great uh, rest of your evening. Thank you again, Dr. Collins. Thank you.